And welcome back. This is K24 This Morning. And like I told you right before we took the break, today is 9th December, also International Anti-Corruption Day. And quite an opportune time to talk about that because we've seen what has been going on in terms of the national conversation. We've had a BBI report, the chapter, exclusively talking about corruption and the monster that it is, but more importantly, how to deal with that even as we move forward. So today we want to take it beyond the rhetoric and marking the day and creating awareness to actual practic uh, practical solutions as to how to deal with this. And to do that, uh, we're joined by Dr. Armand. To DeAndres. He's a regional representative uh, of the UNODC. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Uh, we still have Nerimo Ako with us, Executive Director of Siaso, please, to talk about this. Uh, and Dr. Amado, even as we talk about it being International Anti Corruption Day, I think the headlines uh, that you've seen uh, in the recent past, talking about where we are as a country in terms of corruption, but more importantly, the perception uh, people have of corruption. Um, let's talk about uh, the gains that have been made so far from the last uh, time it was marked last year up until now. What are some of the gains in terms of marking this uh, particular day, Dr. Okay. Amado? Just l let's take a, a look at what is happening in Africa, right. okay? In Africa, every year, we talk about the panorama. The mm -hmm. panorama is that every year we lose about $69 billion right. uh, to corruption. corruption. And globally, the panorama is even worse. Mm -hmm. We lose about $1.1 trillion mm -hmm. to bribery mm -hmm. and $2.6 trillion to stolen assets. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is happening in, in Kenya? We have some good opportunities. First of all, is that in a, in, a, in a situation like in Kenya, where the country is growing at about 5.9% of GDP growth, uh, if the country goes in the same path that has been going in the last two and a half years, the country will be growing at 7% of GDP growth. But what do we need? What are the instruments? Number one, the legislation in Kenya is one of the best legislations. If you, ha if you take a look at the 2016 Bribery Act, right. and you compare it with similar legislation seen in across the continent, mm -hmm. I would say Kenya ranks number one in right. the continent, and probably in the top 10 in, in the world. Uh, there is also a very strong uh, political will from the presidency, from the, from the government, and also from the other sectors of society, including the private sector, to fight corruption. If we take a look at the State of the Nation Address, President Kenyatta talks about the war on corruption. Right. How many times have we seen uh, a president of a country, a head of state, talking about a war on corruption? Which right. means focusing on prevention, which is what we are doing uh, today, focusing on prosecution of perpetrators, and we'll talk about that right now, and focusing on prevention of whistleblowers. But what instruments do we have? If you, we take a look at uh, the latest, uh, uh, basically, investigations on corruption, on, on serious corruption, grand corruption, we see, as the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, that uh, the public prosecutor and the DCI are, have, are, are, are initiating a remarkable crusade against corruption. That's another instrument. And the other instrument that we are seeing in Kenya, with the Blue Company, a number of private sector companies want to become champions against corruption. Right. So what are we achieving? We are st starting to see serious investigations against corrupt practices, but right. serious investigations not in the public sector, but also in the private sector. Right. And I think this is a good start. Okay, and even as we talk about um, a key issue when it comes to corruption is a perception mm -hmm. of the gains made from corruption because we're coming to a time where some youth are looking at um, going out there, making an honest day's uh, right. living, uh, as opposed to the messenger with 700 million shillings in the bank and this looks a bit more lucrative. Let's talk about the perception the youth have because they make up the bulk of uh, the continent's population as well. Where does that stand in terms of trying to make them see that this really isn't the way and discouraging them from thinking that this is the route they should take in terms of uh, you know, earning their livelihood? You know, it's, it's amazing when you talk about legislation and the legislation that exists because we do have good legislation. But on the ground, it's, it's very difficult for you to live life like the right way especially for instance if you are pulled over by a cop or whatever the first thing you want to do is get out of it not because you didn't do the right thing but just because of the system you're going to go to court you don't know how long it's going to take you're going to spend so much money blah 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 but if we had systems like tanzania or rwanda where they find you with immediate effect would be willing to pay and and that's the thing i think with corruption to ordinary citizens where we're at a point where we have young people who are paying someone bribing someone to get a job right and it's not even um a lot of money it's mm -hmm. we're talking about fifteen thousand a month kind of job 150 dollars a month kind of job and you're bribing someone half that money right. to get that job mm -hmm. so when it comes to 
access, when we're talking about access to employment or access to basic needs, and then the system makes it so difficult for you to have those um, resources or that access systematically, people will use other ways or other means to be able to have the access to it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and even as we take, uh, you know, Kenya as a case study and extra, just, uh, you know, paint a wider picture for the continent, one argument that has been had with why corruption cases take so long is um, the paper trail and how it's very complex. Um, how do you actually deal with that so that as we move forward, some people can actually see justice to be served? Because again, it comes down to the point of, you know, justice being seen to be done and actually being done. Because when you talk to ordinary citizens on the street, they say, you know what, um, once it's Dr. Amadou, he's high up there, nothing will happen to him. They the case will go for 15 years and then we'll forget about it. How do you deal with that aspect of justice, you know, taking so long so people think that it didn't actually happen? Well, I think uh, there, are th there are different aspects to this. Um, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime is currently implementing a program in support of the judiciary to mm -hmm. sp actually speed out, uh, you know, the access to justice right. and also a response to the ordinary citizen. Mm -hmm. But also, let me take you back to an example that we have in Kenya, which uh, the average citizen has never heard about. We have a program called ERCOP. ERCOP is a program whereby the UN Office on Drugs and Crime has identified with the Kenyan authorities, Kenyan airport authorities, DCI, uh, ODPP, 22 high-level experts who are put together in the airport, in Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, to identify corrupt officials coming to Kenya and also transnational organized crime and, counter -ter and, and terrorism networks. They go through polygraph tests every six months. They are given the right incentives to fight transnational organized crime and corruption. The head, I'm not going to reveal uh, her identity, but it's a, it's a Kenyan uh, woman. Mm -hmm. And because they are motivated, they feel they, they are making a difference. They are completely non-corrupt. And they are being supported by the government. They are being supported by the, by the uh, by obviously, by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and they are becoming a model in the entire region. Right. What about if with the blue, blue company, talking about corruption in the private sector, which represents 48% right. of corruption in Kenya. Mm -hmm. What about if with the blue company and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, along with the DP, uh, ODPP and DCI, we come to a, a conclusion and to basically, a, we frame a program whereby we focus on two incentives. One is training to generate trainers top trainers, and the other one is certification. And what about if, through the BBI initiative, mm -hmm. we get to have whistleblowers who are fully protected by the government of Kenya, right. and of course, if necessary, by the United Nations system, uh, and those whistleblowers, not only do they, have, do they get an incentive of, say, 5% of their recovery assets, and we are talking about more than $1.27 billion in stolen assets in seven, uh, several jurisdictions away from Kenya. Right. What about if the, per the whistleblower gets 5% of those recovered assets and immediately the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and the Blue Company Initiative, they turn this whistleblower into an oversight and compliance officer in, uh, in the specific company? Right. And what about if uh, in a year and a half we get 17 or 21 uh, Blue uh, blue companies, which are certified also by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, which is the guardian of the UN Convention Against Corruption, which we are celebrating today, and we create a movement, a movement in the, public sec in the private sector and a movement in the private sector whereby corruption doesn't pay. You right. end up in jail. Right. And I think we are right now in a historical moment, and it, it, we, are, we have a historical opportunity to achieve that, because we, not only do we have the United Nations growing here, and by the way, there is corruption, and there has been corruption in the United Nations as well. But there is a system in place so that corrupt UN officials, they end up in jail. Right. But we have to have the same system across the board, whereby the United Nations, along with the private sector and the government, they fight corruption together. Okay. Starting with prevention, but also having a very strong prosecution of corrupt uh, civil servants or private sector officials. Okay, and I want to split this uh, conversation as we move forward to uh, both public and private sector. I want to come to you when it comes to the uh, public sector because one sentiment that was had in a report that was um, done a while back was the reason why many Kenyans aren't, uh, uh, don't have any qualms in parting with a bribe mm. is because of a lack of adequate service delivery. 
and if the quickest way to get the birth certificate for my child Imagine, or, yeah. or something that should have been uh, easy to get is to pay a couple of uh, thousands of shillings, we do that. Yeah. How do you deal with this? Because yes, we'll put up uh, the campaigns and you know, do the PSAs talking about the ills of bribery, but I still need my child's birth certificate. I know, and it's also the same thing with getting a passport or something mm -hmm. like that, where all of a sudden when you pay more, the service is expedited. Mm -hmm. right. And it's because of that you find that you create now a backlog of people who are using the proper systems. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we need to do. It's to be able to find out who are the individuals within in these institutions who are creating those mechanisms and being able to report them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one thing where as much as we encourage people to speak up against corruption, there's nobody who's really charged. You know, I like the part where you're talking about jailing. We do not jail people due to corruption. And, and that's something that it needs to start from high up. Mm -hmm. As soon as it starts from high officials, high level individuals, then it begins to trickle down. Right. But when it comes to the local person or a just going because maybe they stole a chicken because they're trying to eat, that's the person who will end up in jail for three years. Right. So it does not make any sense. So we need to be able to have systems to wear an average system where we see an average citizen sees something is wrong and they're able to report it and something will be done with that report. We're talking about even the police being able to support you because even when we talk about youth, youth are actually afraid of the police. Right. You want to avoid them because every time you see them, you feel, what have I done? The first thing you start to look at is everything okay? Do I have my ID? Am I driving on the wrong side? Am right. I walking? Because youth get arrested for loitering here. Mm -hmm. Walking in town past 6 p.m., a group of young people can be arrested in this county. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that we need to talk about, where we see law enforcement as friends. We believe that law enforcement is there to protect us. And we believe that there's a system that works for people and not just for the rich and not just for people within government. Right. Right, and even as we talk about um, uh, the government side of things, I want to uh, uh, you know, task uh, Dr. Amad also to talk about the private sector in the sense that even as we talk about corruption, it's largely perceived to be a government affair, but it doesn't happen in a vacuum. The private sectors are uh, involved in this, and also the financial institutions. What has the UNODC or the UN at large thought about getting all of these financial players in a room? Because we've seen you know, the money and the assets leave Gambia, South Africa, Kenya, and end up in a foreign bank somewhere. How do you get all of them together to tighten these loopholes so that there can be a higher standard as to how uh, the money flows in and just to make sure that this isn't money of ill gain that's in their bank account wherever it is across the world? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I think uh, what we need to think about in Kenya, Kenya is, is, is going to, Kenya, we, we are talking about a society of 49 million people. But let's take Kenya 20 years from now mm -hmm. and the continent. The continent, we are talking about 2.1 billion people. But in 20 years from now, we're going to be talking about six. 1.1 billion people. This is going to be the most popul populated uh, continent in the world. Kenya has a key incentive to fight corruption. What is it? Economic growth. Right. The realization of the Big Four agenda. What do we propose? We propose uh, the Blue Company and UNODC to have assistance in place whereby we pick, we identify private sector champions in the hotel industry, in the financial sector, also in the telecommunication sector. Right. Uh, I would say t 17 to 20, whereby we, number one, we establish a system in place where a whistleblower protection mechanism is put in place across the board. Mm -hmm. And it's taken as an example. We, incre we increase also the, basically the bonuses, the, the motivating factors for these whistleblowers to come forward. Right. We have also a mechanism in place for ethical uh, uh, anti-corruption officials or officers to be in each one of these, uh, for example, in a bank or in a hotel. Because let's not forget that corruption is also uh, is, a, is a breeder of drug trafficking, mm -hmm. terrorism, etc. The, the Ducid attack, that costed $27,000 only. Mm -hmm. So through briberies, etc., we can have a lot of uh, corru uh, uh, corruption and also a uh, terrorism attacks. So our proposal is to have, you know, a, a, a systems in place where all these whistleblower mechanisms, oversight officers are really meeting international uh, standards at, at the level of the UN Convention Against uh, Corruption. And we then expand this to the rest of the private sector in, uh, in Kenya. And we are also proposing the following. In countries like Panama, uh, we have 
I mean, the UN ODC has uh, established with the private sector a trust fund for public sector, private sector entities to generate assets from recovered assets, and these assets to be funding specific social initiatives. Right. Be them, you know, building uh, schools, education systems, uh, putting in place a social security scheme for the, uh, pri for the entire private sector, etc. Right. We would propose the same thing through the right incentives to have a trust fund whereby part of these recovered assets go through the private sector for public sector uh, uh, in private priority initiatives, for example, along the lines of the Big Four agenda. Right. And I think this is, this is doable. Okay. Uh, and i give you one example. Uh, we are going to have a, a, an event at uh, 10.30 with the Kenyan Wildlife Service. The Kenyan Wildlife Service is an example for the UN of how a public sector entity can fight corruption. If we can take this example of the Kenyan Wildlife Service uh, with the international community and the Kenyan government and basically extrapolate it and use it in other private sector entity cases, right. we'll really have, we will get to have champions against corruption with the Blue uh, Company Initiative and the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Okay, and as I said, everything um, uh, prevention is better than cure, mm -hmm. isn't it? So even as you look at um, how we'll uh, you know, tighten uh, the, the prosecutorial uh, aspects of the case and get more uh, people to go to jail, let's take it back to how we prevent this. Um, yeah. How do we uh, make this less appealing? How do we uh, create a different narrative from where you stand as far as uh, corruption is concerned? Rewarding, rewarding people who do good, incentives. Um, talking about it to even younger. We need to actually involve children. I wouldn't even say youth. And the importance of building a country because when we're talking about growth, we're talking about a bound that frankly, I don't think our government understands just how young the population is. And I know even for Kenya, 19, but with our new census, it's a little bit younger than that. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about an average age that is so youthful, that means that when the majority of the population is youthful, how are they able to have access to their basic needs without feeling that they are competing because of scarcity? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the mentality that we have, where you want to be able to get as much as you can because you're not sure when you're going to be able to get an opportunity like this and everybody is in survival mode. Right. And it's because of how our services are provided when, when you don't have even access to healthcare, when you're talking about going to a private hospital to being able to see a good doctor, one that's able to even give you medication or have access to that medication, you have to have money. Mm -hmm. And so when we live in a world where you have to have money to, make, to even survive, then people will do what they can. Mm -hmm. But also when we see the people who are successful, we are seeing them successful, but we don't ask them how they get to their wealth. Right. When we have politicians who have so much wealth and no one quite understands where that wealth comes from. And the government has tried with initiatives from even Kibaki's administration about declaring their wealth, but not many politicians have declared that wealth. They're not very open about it. So it's not transparent. And even when we have that transparency, when the Auditor General was giving reports about how much is going toward corruption, we still have governors in office. Mm. And so they do need to be either fired, stepped down, they need to be drastic action, and young people need to see that drastic action happening so that they are discouraged. Okay. from practicing corruption. Okay, okay. Yeah. and of course, uh, very briefly, we'll be talking about um, the event today. You'll we'll give us more details on that, but from where you stand, I'm at a personal level, because uh, some people might be watching this discussion and thinking, oh, that's Dr. Armando's issue and the government, and if you're a CEO of a top company, well, you deal with corruption. At a very individual level, how can they uh, take part in uh, this particular fight against corruption? I think, uh, uh, let's go back to the idea that Kenya has two key assets, young people, Kenya has one of the youngest populations in the world, a growing population. And Kenya has another factor that Europe has lost, a growing middle class. So if we take the growing middle class and the young population and we say, look, you can do something, you can, we are going to create a, a hotline to report cases of corruption in the private sector. But also, we can also support a similar initiative through the public sector, mm -hmm. but as I said, when one reports cases of corruption, one has to make sure that has the right incentives to report corruption and one is going to be protected mm -hmm. from, of course, uh, prosecution or from uh, you know, um, a threat against uh, one's life. So the government 
is in the best position to ensure that these mechanisms are put in place. Right. Um, let's not also forget that President Kenyatta has been named and appointed as the global champion for youth. Mm -hmm. so not only in the, in the continent, but also globally. And I think we have to use that instrument to basically take the fight against corruption through the private sector and the public sector and uh, beyond Kenya, right. using Kenya as an example. So number one, I think we have to start using also champions in the private sector, also in the art, art sector, mm -hmm. singers, right. uh, TV producers, you, journalists, mm -hmm. who can act as role models for other sectors of society to be able to report corruption okay. and to fight against corruption. I think also the UN has, has, a, has a role in, first of all, us becoming a role model in the fight against corruption. We are trying to do it, and we have to join forces with the government and the private sector. That's why exactly we are joining forces with the uh, Blue Company Initiative, right. okay. to be able to have this kind of blue shield, blue certification of UNODC and a group of uh, private sector companies in Kenya to certify non-corrupt private sector companies in the banking system, in the hotel industry, etc. So prevention is one of them. Of course, the prosecution aspect is crucial. If we know that prosecution is being effective against corruption, and so far, humbly, I think, from the point of view of an international civil servant who has been dealing with the, the fight against corruption for about 21 years, I think I see light at the end of the tunnel when I take a look at what uh, the DPP and DCI mm -hmm. are doing together. Right. I think things are happening. Okay. And I think we are going to get to the, to the point of uh, basically what, what we see in Spain, in my own country, where the son-in-law of the king is in jail for corrupt right. practices and embezzlement of public funds. I think we are very close to getting to that level right now in Kenya. Okay. okay. And even as we bring this to a close, there's an event happening today uh, marking international anti-corruption. Uh, uh, Dear, let's talk about that very quickly. Where is it happening? What are the details on the event? Okay. We, uh, UNODC and, and a number of uh, international partners uh, mostly INL from the State Department of the United States of America plus the European Union. Mm -hmm. We have been supporting the Kenyan Wildlife Service in the establishment of an anti-corruption framework, which as I mentioned is going to be taken as a model, not only in Africa but globally. So we are going to have an event to, uh, to uh, showcase uh, how uh, best inter international anti-corruption practices have been used uh, by the Kenyan Wildlife Service and uh, we are going to be showcasing that also in other countries in the region in the next uh, two weeks. Okay. Marking the International Day Against Corruption. And why is it the 9th of December? Because on the 9th of December of about 16 years ago, uh, all member states signed the UN Convention Against Corruption in Merida, in a beautiful place in uh, Mexico. We are mm -hmm. commemorating that. Mm -hmm. And the fight against corruption in, in Kenya has to be uh, showcased in a sector that is uh, particularly important for the Kenyan growth, the Kenyan economic growth, which is wildlife and forests. Okay, uh, we leave it at that as far as it's concerned. Thank you so much for making time Thank this you. morning, uh, Dr. Amaru. Talking about uh, corruption and how you can play a part as well, it's not only government agencies and companies playing a part, but wherever you are in your own uh, you know, space of life, you can effect that particular change, and that's what it's all about uh, uh, this uh, day. It's all about International Anti-Corruption Day. So mark it wherever you are. We'd like your tweets as well on what you'll do uh, this uh, day at K24TV. Uh, you can also SMS us on 21222. Thank you so much, Nerima Wako, for making time this morning as well. We take a short break. We are back on the other side as we get interactive. Morning.